Okay. Well, in today's presentation, we are going to talk about um, a topic that is uh, important for all of us and is about project-based learning. And so the name of our presentation is going from the B problem to the B assessment. And obviously we are here with uh, Veronica Velázquez, with Gustavo Pereira Méndez, and with Jimena Martínez Spangenberg, who are here with us. And the aim of our presentation is to go through the different parts of a project, starting with the problem and finishing with the assessment of the project. So in the next slide, we are going to see that one of the most important elements in, in our presentation is the B. You may wonder why is the B problem? Why is the B assessment? B stands for blended. You know that in these in these pandemic times, uh, we are working most of the time virtually. So we have shifted from our face-to-face -face work into virtual work. So it is said that I mean the authorities are saying that when we go back to normal, we are going to be working with a blended with a blended method. That means that we are going to be working face to face, but also we are going to be working virtually. So this idea of B and blending uh, is related to several areas. We are blending the content because we are using content from different, from different areas. And one thing that is important to, to know uh, from the very beginning is that when we work with problems and when we work with projects, um, we need to we need to know that we are not going to have a subject vision we are going to have a holistic vision that means that whenever we have a problem or whenever we do a project we have a multi-dimensional perspective of one issue another aspect another aspect is the sources okay the sources are related to what sources we are going to use in order to carry out a project. So um, a problem and a project are related to um, using virtual resources, physical resources, mental resources, emotional resources, different type of resources. Also, another element that is important is blended strategies. You know that there are five different types of strategies. We have cognitive, metacognitive, social, affective, and compensational strategies. Well, here, what I would say that blended, blended strategies implies to, the, to how we are going to use the strategies in this new scenario. And for example, uh, in, in our everyday work, we, we were using cognitive and metacognitive strategies most of the time. However, what I would say is that we are going to use a lot of compensational strategies here. What compensational strategies are is, uh, I mean, it's self-explanatory because compensational refers to those strategies that we need to use in order to compensate the lack of knowledge or the lack of resources. So for example, in this case, we don't have the face-to-face -face, uh, idea. We don't have the face-to-face -face work. So since we don't have the face-to-face -face work, we have to, um, we have to deal with uh, this idea of uh, working with face-to-face -face, uh, activities and virtual activities. So compensational means, okay, I don't have the teacher, so I need to compensate with website. I have to compensate this way we are doing today. We can compensate by working with, uh, with um, platforms like Zoom or Meet or other platforms that we have available. Also, we have blended projects because we said at the very beginning that projects are multidimensional solutions. So, um, for example, if we have a problem, uh, the same problem can be seen from four different perspectives if we were to discuss this within this group. I mean, Jimena can have one perspective, Gustavo can have another perspective, Veronica can have another perspective, and obviously I can have another perspective. So this idea of having different perspectives is one thing that enriches our project. So a big problem, and let's get started at the very beginning, 
a B problem is a situation that is multidimensional and the solution has different perspectives. Here, uh, and also interpretation approaches and views of the same reality as, as it is said there. Uh, for all of you, uh, it may come to your minds the ideas from Paulo Freire, because Paulo Freire said that we approach a situation, we approach our, the reality, we approach a solution with the knowledge that we have. And what does it mean? That means uh, what happens here, uh, what happens here is that um, we are seeing the reality with our subjectivity. That means that if we look at the picture, the picture will be different according to our own schemata, according to our own prior knowledge. So in the next slide, we are going to see that this idea of the problem has some characteristics that are very good, not only for, for, for our time, for our virtual time, but also for any time that we, are, um, that we can have. So the first thing is this holistic approach, because when you work with a problem, you are not working from the perspective of English or from the perspective of math or from the perspective of uh, literature. We are working with a particular problem from a holistic view. And that means that whenever we have a problem, we are going to, we are going to approach the same problem from different from different angles, from different perspectives. So for example, if our problem is to spend 2,000 pesos in order to go uh, on a trip to the museum, obviously I need a perspective of math, I need a perspective of, of Spanish, I need a perspective of English, I need a perspective of art because we are going to a museum, I need a perspective of uh, biology because I need to know how I'm going to be safe in this pandemic time, so there are different things that I need to consider whenever I'm working with uh, a problem, and especially a problem that is a B problem, a, ben a blended problem. That means that we are going to use different approaches and resources to solve it. Also, this leads to the flexibility and adaptability of the problem. And this has to do not only with, um, not only with uh, a B problem, but any problem is flexible and adaptable to the reality of the student. Why? Because the student is going to solve the problem with the knowledge they have. So if you, if you solve the problem with the, with the knowledge you have, then it's easy for you and it's adaptable to the level, it's adaptable to the social context, it's adaptable to anything related to the student. Also, whenever we are working in a, in a B problem, we have this idea. I told you some minutes ago that uh, provided we have um, a problem, Jimena, Gustavo, Veronica and I will have a different perspective. But when we start discussing the solutions to the problem, I will give, I will give my solution, Jimena will give her solution, Gustavo will give his solution, and then Veronica will give her solution. But then when we start discussing all these solutions that are real for each of us, become uh, challenged. So, for example, I would challenge Jimena, Jimena would challenge Gustavo, and Veronica would challenge mine, and, and all, I mean, it's going to be a good moment of discussion. And this use of the, this, this idea of discussion is great because, for many reasons, from the cognitive perspective, because we are creating a cognitive conflict, as it says here, but also, something that is that is not minor is that we are using something that is that are called basic interpersonal communicative skills what and what that means that we are learning how to listen to the other person we are learning how to negotiate we are learning how to give arguments so we are learning things that are basic that are social and things that are going to be necessary for the classroom but also outside the classroom Another aspect that is that, that is here in the in the in, in, in the presentation is the use of the students' prior knowledge, the use of schemata, the use of ideas that are prior to the students, and uh, or 
in, in the student, that are in the student's mind, and something that is really important from the motivational perspective, and, and is the fact that everything that is in your schemata is true for you, because it's part of a prior experience that you have, and in this prior experience, you learned that this could be useful in the future, that this was true at a particular moment. And since you have this, this idea as true, then whenever you have a problem, you are going to use it. So you are not going to be fearful of sharing this in front of other colleagues. Since you are not fearful of sharing in front of other, other colleagues, then you are going to see that uh, there will be a kind of flow within the discussion that you are going to be discussing and you will not be afraid of discussing, you will not be afraid of sharing. Why? Because what you believe is true. Obviously, then in the interaction with your, with your colleagues and because of what I told you before, because of this cognitive conflict that is created, then your experience is going to be challenged. And since it is challenged, then your experience can stay true or can vary. And that is called experiencing learning. And Kolb is the main author related to this idea. But also, what we have here, you are going to be fostering autonomy, self-efficacy, personal interest, and value. Adriana de los Santos was giving a presentation last Saturday, and she was talking about fostering the autonomy of the students. And I think that whenever you work with problem-based learning and project-based learning, and Mind you that I'm talking about the two concepts at the same time because the project is the solution to a problem. So in my mind, both of them are different sides of the same coin. So working with a problem, working with a project is, is important because uh, you promote autonomy. And how do you promote autonomy? By promoting self-direction because the student needs to set particular particular objectives in order to be autonomous in order to be self-directed and the self-efficacy you all know that self-efficacy is when you believe that you can do something personal interest i mean is self-explanatory and value has to do with the value that you assign to do a particular thing and in the case of problem-based learning and project-based learning the value is assigned when the project is not given by the teacher but is discovered by the student so the student needs to see a problem in order to carry out a project. I, for example, if I ask my students, carry out a project on contaminated wat uh, waters or on polluted waters or polluted rivers, for the students, this is far from the reality unless they live close to a river because you go and you can have tap water or you can have mineral water. So it's not an issue to have polluted water in your houses. So you have to recognize when you have a problem and when, you, um, when the students recognize this problem as theirs. So this is an important element related to value. And finally, we have social motivation, which is this idea of sharing knowledge and constructing knowledge together. And we are an example because in our group with Jimena, Gustavo and Veronica, we are constructing knowledge all the time, every day, and this idea of working together is something that helps us um, with our motivation to continue developing and constructing that knowledge. So if in the next slide, uh, we are going to see that project-based learning, I told you before that project-based learning has to do with, a or is a counterpart of problem-based learning. So project-based learning is a method but it's not only a method, but also is the solution of the problem that I told you. And we are, um, what we are highlighting here in a project-based learning is the process of learning instead of the product. I mean, for most of us, um, when we work with project-based learning, we want to see the project, so the final product, the outcome of, of the process. But what is interesting about project-based learning is that we can see the process of learning and from what i told you you can get that this process is authentic okay why is authentic because the problem is a problem for the student so if i work with a problem that is mine then 
uh, the process of learning is authentic. It's also based on questions. That's why it's inquiry based, because you are working with questions you can use a Socratic method and you can ask, why is this? Why is this? Why is this? Why is this? And you can go forward into more concrete and into a deeper understanding of a particular topic. So the thinking of the student is highlighted here. And instead of me as a teacher lecturing and giving, telling the students everything, I would say that project-based learning and problem-based learning are methods that are student-centered in 100% and they are an alternative to passive learning and road memorization. That's why from Infección de Inglés and from all the all ANEP, we are promoting the use of problem-based learning and project-based learning, not only for adults, which is kind of uh, the method uh, suggested for adults, but also to anyone, and especially in these pandemic times, because now you, you don't have time, you don't have all the students connected to to tell them and to lecture, but definitely you can promote inquiring by, by asking them, by setting tasks that are challenging for them and for their prior knowledge. So that's why I think that problem-based learning and project-based learning are great uh, methods to use during these times and, and blended projects are going to be the future of of this method. So in the next slide, we are going to see how <clears throat> all this idea of project-based learning has a particular theoretic, theoretical foundation that I have been I have been mentioning before, but I'm going to I'm going to refresh some of the concepts. First of all, when you work with problem-based learning and project-based learning, you are working with situated learning because you are putting the students in a particular situation and the, the student has to give solutions to that particular and multi-dimensional situation that, you, that, that the student is set to. So situated learning is one of the, one of the approaches that is most common uh, nowadays and, and not, not something that it was invented now. It's been, it's been used for a long time, but it's something that uh, we are promoting from on the side of ANEP because it's a very meaningful and significant way of learning for the students. And this produces a lot of motivation on the side of the student, but also a lot of motivation on the side of the teacher because the teacher needs to put less effort, maybe more thinking, but less effort to motivate the students and the students feel like everything is flowing and they feel like uh, we are definitely working um, on something that is valuable for them, that is important for them, that is part of their own uh, world. And that is something that we want to promote and we want to use because of all the benefits that it has. As, we, as I was mentioning some minutes ago, <clears throat> this idea of working, of working in projects and working in problems can be enriched when you work in groups. And working in groups promotes social motivation, that is the idea of sharing, of constructing knowledge through the interaction with others. But also this produces, methodologically speaking, something that is called cooperative learning. And when we talk about cooperative learning, I'm going to talk about this idea of cooperative learning compared to collaborative learning. Remember that there is a subtle difference between collaborative learning and cooperative learning. Collaborative learning is when people are working together and I don't care what they share, I don't care. They are just working together because of geographical reasons, because, of, because I don't want to correct as many assignments as I should. Um, but in the case of cooperative learning, things change because I have the belief that each person is contributing with something. Let's imagine that we are doing a, an activity with the Musketeers with Jimena, Gustavo and Veronica. So for example, like right at this moment, let's imagine that this is a project, okay? So for example, uh, Veronica is sharing the screen. So she's doing something, I'm talking. And then Jimena and Gustavo are doing other activities. They are assessing the, assessing the, the presentation 
while we are doing the presentation. So the four of us are doing something different. So each of us is contributing with something that is unique and it's, and it's giving more uh, value to the presentation itself. And why I'm saying this? Because if I were uh, presenting myself alone, I would uh, have to do everything on my own. And obviously I would, it would be much more difficult because um, I, would be, I would have to be paying attention to changing the slide, to paying attention to the connection, to paying attention to what I say. So everybody is contributing with something. And you are going to see this in our work with rubrics because each of us work with different categories and all of us criticize the rubrics of the others. And through this criticism, which is a problem-based and project-based learning, um, one, thing that, uh, one thing that it's important is that cooperative learning <coughs> works in this way. Let's go back to, to the previous slide. Gustavo is contributing with something. You see how, how it's important to have this this, all these contributions, Gustavo is saying that I could manage with all, with all these, but actually he used the should instead of the could. But, and it's true, I mean, I can do it and I should do it if I do it myself, but I see the richness of working together. And actually, I guess that I am more relaxed talking to you because other people are paying attention to other things that I'm not, that I'm not uh, doing. So, Thank you, Gustavo, for this contribution. I think it makes it makes sense to uh, and please, Gustavo, Jimena, and Veronica, please give me your contributions while uh, I'm talking, so I can contribute with more things. So um, uh, the other the other thing is the bits and the calves. I already mentioned the bits, the basic interpersonal communicative skills, and the calves that are the cognitive academic language proficiency strategies or skills. And this is something that we as teachers have very clear, but not always uh, use uh, in our classes. I mentioned before that working with problems and working with projects promotes the bits that are the basic interpersonal communicative skills. Uh, so um, one thing is that we are working with negotiation, how to listen to the other people, how to give arguments. So all, all those things are related to to communication, so how to communicate with others. So when I talk, the others have to listen. When the others talk, I have to listen, which is kind of difficult sometimes because when you think that you have the truth about something, everybody speaks at the same time. And if you are a little anxious like I am, so then uh, it's gonna be kind of, it's kind of difficult. Okay, so uh, yes, so I need to focus. On, on this on this aspect. So, and then we have the cognitive academic language proficiency strategies. So the cognitive uh, language proficiency strategies are related to, um, to everything related to cognition. So it's related to any, everything that is related to how the person learns. So these are the, the strategies that we pay attention when we are teachers, because we are paying attention to how they read, how they produce a text, how they speak. So we are, we are focused on, on that area instead of working on the basic communication skills. Why is that? Because many of us believe that those basic interpersonal communicative skills have to come from, from home. And that is not always true. I mean, and you know that more and more this has changed. However, and there is always a however, However, in these pandemic times, when the students are at home, when the students are with their parents most of the time or with someone, someone that has to be at home, this has changed because now they are more time with their families and less time with the teacher. So um, I think, I have the feeling that this idea of the basic interpersonal communicative skills has changed. So another aspect is authentic and democratic assessment that you can uh, that you can definitely uh, see um, you can definitely see that uh, what we are going to do with assessment today what we are going to do with uh, with rubrics is going to sh is going to uh, give you this idea of authentic and democratic assessment because rubrics um, 
is a tool that is going to give you the idea of working objectively with assessment. Apart from this, we have constructivism because we are constructing knowledge through the interaction of people, through this cooperative learning and social motivation. And finally, this idea of experiential learning that I mentioned before and you have called here, and this idea of all my prior experience is used in order to discuss about a particular topic and this experience can become true or truer if these words exist um, then, uh, then another aspect is that um, experience, this experience can be challenged and can be discarded. And something that Gustavo is contributing and is true is that the concept of education has changed now or because parents, uh, parents have noticed that there is another scenario at the moment. So there are their idea related to education and the idea of the role that they have in education has changed. They have different concepts, they have a completely different concept related to education. And I agree with Gustavo uh, regarding this because now the, the parents sit with the kids and do the, do the activities, not only the homework, but also the main activities and also they have time, sometimes they are connected because they have to connect in the same device. Sometimes they are connected when the teacher is like us having a Zoom activity or a Zoom meeting or when the teacher provides uh, activities in CREA. So, um, so that, is, that is a huge change. And thanks Gustavo for this contribution. This produced a huge change in the mindset of the parents regarding education. So in the next slide, we are going to go through um, some more ideas. Okay, going to the stages, the different stages of uh, this project, uh, we have six different and very identifiable um, parts. The first part is the trigger. The trigger is this information or this uh, idea that in which the student uh, really gets interested in a particular topic and finds a problem related to that particular problem. So after, after the student finds, uh, finds the, the, the situation, finds the topic, uh, or the teacher sets a particular topic in which the students get interested, then we have the question. So after this, the teacher asks uh, why something or what solution can you find to this idea? So, um, and then the student has to go and research and discuss and find possible solutions. In this stage, in stage number three, when it, talk, when it comes to the discussion, you can also trigger another aspect of motivation that is pro-social motivation. Pro-social motivation is when students find people who have a particular knowledge about the um, topic. Let's say that you want to create a new square, okay? A new square in which you have, you have um, green spaces and you have benches and you have everything for kids and, and for other people. For example, I have the idea of having a square for dogs, just for dogs so they can go and play with other dogs and they have fun. They can have fun in a very secure environment. In different parts of the world, you can find those, those squares, but there is no one here in Uruguay yet. So let's imagine we do this. So we have to, we have to ask a vet, we have to ask an architect, we have to ask a person who knows about the security. So we can have different people that can give us input related to, uh, to the particular project. So the outcome of all this, of the, of the finding the topic, the question that we have, and then the research and the discussion and the possible solution is the project itself. So it's the outcome, the outcome. And when you have an outcome, when you have a project, you have to share the project with people. So you have the presentation of the project. And finally, you assess and evaluate the project. 
you can end here in the assessment or evaluation, or this assessment and evaluation can be the trigger for another for another uh, project. So that is a that is a great benefit of working with projects. That sometimes the project can be a, sometimes a project can be like the trigger for another project. So in the next slide, in the next slide. We, we are going to give you a project and this project is taken from our brand new book that is going to that is going to be in 2021 but we are piloting at the moment that is called leaving uruguay 2 unit 2 it says your everyday activities in the media and it says the teacher and the students what they do when they are at home so this can be the trigger okay you can you can start working with uh, the activities they start saying, I do this, I do that, blah, 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 blah. Then uh, the teacher asks the students to record a video about the activities they do in the free time. Obviously, they are not going to, as a teacher, you are not going to say it in this way. But for example, you can say, if you had to share this with the world, or if you had to record a TikTok video, or if you had to record something related to, to your daily life, what would you share with the world? So you can ask the students to record a video and, and this video uh, can be related to the activities they do in their free time. So the video and the activities from this unit can help the learners and a possible to suggestion could be to include a poster presentation or an Instagram story presentation or a TikTok video. So here you can foresee the outcome of the project. So, the, so, uh, so this idea of working with a project, we have here a slide, and this is from our brand new book, Living Uruguay 2, Unit 2. And here we have an example of a project that obviously you as a teacher have to give a twist to what it says here. But it says the name of the, of the project is your everyday activities in the media. So as the teachers, you start working with the everyday activities of the students, so they are sharing their activities. And so one, one question that you can ask them could be, okay, um, if you had to share one activity with the rest of the world, what activity would you share? And, when, and they can decide that they want to share one particular activity or a set of activities and you say, okay, I would like to see that in a particular in a particular format. It can be an Instagram story presentation or a video or a TikTok or a poster presentation because there are some people that are more of digital immigrants or they don't have the resources and they may want to do a poster. So with all these, they are going to create a project uh, and the project is going to be assessed with a set of rubrics that we have in the in in the book and that you are going to see in some minutes so if we go to the next slide you are going to see all these analyzed more in depth and you are going to see that the triggers are the activities the characters do in their free time the ones that are shown in the book then the question is what students do in their free time or what they want to share i have changed the question what do you want to share to the rest of the world or what do you want to share to your colleagues or to your friends then you have the research, discussion, and possible solutions. Um, so you, you can discuss with your co-workers, with your colleagues and say, okay, I would like to share the sports I practice, or I would like to share, or let's imagine that Jimena, Veronica, and Gustavo, and I want to share something in common. So let's imagine that the four of us like to go to the cinema. So we want to share about going to the cinema and we want to create something for example a tiktok video of a famous uh, scene from one movie from a scary movie let's say and the four of us are interacting and doing the tiktok video is it it's possible it's absolutely possible and it's very creative and the students are working with what they like then they put the project in in crea and we can present the project in Zoom or conference, which is the which is the the, the platform uh, from Crea, and then we can do the assessment and evaluation through Kahoot, 
And I chose Kahoot particularly because you'll see that the set of rubrics that we created have four bands. So I associated immediately the colors of the the colors of the different the colors of the different um, options in Kahoot with the different bands that we have in the set of rubrics that obviously, and not that obviously, but I would say we as a team, we believe that uh, the set of rubrics uh, has to be shared with the students in advance when you give the task, when you ask them to create a project, so they know the expectations of the teacher. They know what they want from you, okay? So that has to be crystal clear from the very beginning. So in the next slide, you'll see uh, some examples of how to trigger students' interest in a particular topic. So for example, this is one way of triggering a student's imagination is through pictures. Uh, you can ask them to, to think and to give ideas about what's going on in the different pictures. So if we change slide, you are going to see another trigger. Another trigger is the use of videos. We are not going to see the video, but in this particular video that, that, that is here and that you can watch later on, we have a commercial from the Canadian TV in which they talk about um, the seatbelt, how to, how to buckle up uh, and how important it is to be buckled up, okay? So if we go to the next slide, another way of triggering is through exploratory trips. You can go to the museum, you can go to a field trip. Uh, once I was giving a presentation, a face-to-face -face presentation to a group of teachers uh, and the chemistry teacher told me, uh, I would like to, you, you know, I did an exploratory trip to the river because she wanted to work with contaminated waters. And she said, well, I, I had an exploratory trip, but believe it or not, something happened. And none of the students uh, actually worked with contaminated waters. And I said, yes, because what I told you before, because this is not part of the students, of the students' problems. This is not part of their close uh, or inner circle of life. Um, yes, it's, as, as Gustavo is, is, is saying here, is a problem or a challenge. I would say that problem from the methodological perspective, but from the motivational perspective, it has to be a challenge. And so the students from this school in Florida went to the river and the river was contaminated. And and the teacher wanted them to realize that it was that the river was contaminated, but what happened instead was that they saw that there was a lack of places to have barbecues, that they didn't have a green space to play football. They realized that it was not safe uh, for little kids to have the river there because it was it was uh, deep. Uh, so, isn't it interesting because? When you do an exploratory trip, it's not what you want them to do, but what they realize, what they see as a problem. And my um, and one thing that happens, and, and here Gustavo is saying that we have to bear in mind students' reality and needs, and that is very important. And, and one thing that, that is very relevant here is that uh, the problem has to be a problem for the students. And what I told you before, uh, is it a problem for students to work with contaminated waters? Not really, because they have, they have uh, pure water at home, either mineral water or tap water. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And in the next slide, whenever you, whenever you have this, you set a problem. And that is what Gustavo was just mentioning, challenge-based learning. So you set a challenge and the challenge can be through by means of a question. So you set a problem and, <clears throat> and here the students start working on finding a solution to the problem. Let's go to the next slide. So one possibility is to change the student's mindset. For example, in this case, uh, it says Tata Motors uh, plant on the boil, worker threat and hunger strike. So here, one way of challenging the students is to change the headlines 
or to change the mindset or work on how the media influences our lives. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is another way of triggering students. So whenever we have a, a problem, we have to ask the right question. And the question has to be a combination of a description, but also of a challenge, uh, as we were saying before. So the question is probably the most important part of the, of the, of, of the process, because the answer to the question is going to be the answer to the problem and it's going to be the outcome for the outcome for uh, for the pro for the all the process of project based learning let's move on and after this you have research and discussion and in this idea of b of for blending we have to go to web quest and um, another aspect is mentoring what i told you before about pro social motivation when you go and ask people who know more than we know in order to uh, in order to answer or in order to assess and give us advice on what to do and what not to do regarding a particular topic. One issue that is interesting and important and it has to do with a, cha with a change in mindset of the, par the parents, the family, but also the teachers is what's going on right now with, with technology. Because for example, if I were a history teacher and I asked, when was William Shakespeare born? I don't, I, I mean, this, this is redundant. This is not useless. It, 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 sorry, this is not useful. Why is not useful? It's not useful because I can Google for information and I know when, when he was born. So if I know the, the question has to change in order to promote a challenge. So I need to construct in my mind uh, something new, putting together all the information that I get from different sources. For that reason is blended construction, blended learning, blended problems, blended solution, and blended projects. Okay, thank you. And let's continue with the next slide. In the next slide, we have ways of presenting this. Okay, why one, one way is with collaborative mind mapping uh, in which the students can be in different houses, but they can be working together creating, creating, sorry, mind maps and putting knowledge together. So another, another app that you can use in order to work uh, collaboratively is with interactive multimedia posters. Remember that part of the project that I shared with you from our new book is to create a poster and you can create interactive multimedia posters. So you don't have, you don't need to have the traditional paper poster, but you can have multimedia posters that can be uploaded to CREA and that you can work uh, in any class with any students. And that's, that's a wonderful way of changing uh, the matrix of, um, of resources that we are using in the classroom. So let's move on. Uh, and in the next one, we have two more, two more uh, apps here. We have My Histro. My history has to do with a, a map in which you can be sharing uh, different activities that you do in a particular place at a particular moment. So as you can see in the picture, there are some bubbles. So you click on the bubble and the bubble uh, opens a dialogue in which you can share something that you did or something that an activity or a place that you create uh, and it has to do with your own history related to um, related to that particular place. So you can ask a student, for example, to talk about different places in, in the city and you can have the, the map of the city, but then you can have bubbles with different places that are good or favorite for the students we have. Then you have Poplet that is similar to a Padlet. Uh, that is another resource that we can use and it's also a collaborative way of working. And I believe that this is very useful in this time in which we are working virtually, but it's going to be very useful later on when we go back to face-to-face, uh, -face. because when we go back to face-to-face, -face, we are going to be so used to working with technology that we are going to, we are going to be willing to work uh, with technology in the future. So let's go to the next slide. 
we have Mentimeter, uh, we have Mentimeter, and um, in this Mentimeter, we can create polls, and we have Direct Poll, that is also another app that you can use for the same reason, and then you have Kahoot, that I said that you can use for, uh, for the assessment. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, then we have the project that is the outcome and you know depending on what you are asking the students is what you are going to have as the outcome so let's move on and finally you have the present finally no we have the assessment but during the presentation the presentation sometimes is a uh, can be can be seen in a in a very vague or superficial uh, way by all of us but when you when you ask the students to present I think that there are three elements that you have to consider. First of all, that you have to train your students in how to pronounce. So you need to devote some time to help them pronounce and to help them work on their speech. Uh, another, another thing that is important is to tell them about something that is called the onion theory that is used in journalism. And the onion theory talks about how they have to present the information. So they have to go from the very general as if they were peeling the different, the different layers of an onion until they get to the core, which is the most important part or the most relevant part in a, in, a, in a presentation. So they cannot start talking about minor things, or not minor, but I would say concrete things, but they have to start from the very general and then go to the more, to the more concrete. And finally, they have to pay attention to the posture, and if it, is a, if it is an online presentation, you can add other elements. For example, how they manage with, a, with the presentation itself, if they can use the resources, the electronic resources appropriately, et cetera. For example, what I told you at the very beginning of this presentation, since we are a group, Veronica is sharing, Gustavo and Jimena are telling me things that I forget about the presentation. So, uh, each of us has a particular a particular um, role in this presentation, and that's why uh, it's a truly uh, collaborative activity. Okay, so the last part, and let's go to the to the following slide, to the next slide. We have assessment and evaluation, and here we are going to have we are going to do team presentation with Jimena, Veronica, and Gustavo regarding this, this part. So first of all, Jimena is going, to, is going to talk about how we created this set of rubrics that you are about to, uh, that you are about to see. Okay, hello to everyone. Uh, today we are going to share with you the rubric we created to evaluate projects. In order to create this rubric, we had to follow different steps. First, we had to think about our ideal student and how this student would be like. And we thought that our ideal student would be someone who uh, uses pictures as a common thread, as a memory support and as a strategy to convey what he or she is presenting. Someone who is fluent, who keeps a balance between quantity and quality, uh, who aligns with progresiones de aprendizaje para el ramo 3, para segundas lenguas y lenguas extranjeras, and also someone uh, who makes eye contact not only with the classmates, but also with the teacher. Well, first we thought of the criteria, and then we decided the amount of bands we were going to have, and we decided we were going to use four bands. And finally, we wrote the descriptors. We started writing descriptor number four, which is teacher's expectations, and then we wrote descriptor number one, two, and three. While writing the descriptors, we moved away from the theory, from, from the deficit theory, sorry, and instead we bear in mind what our students are capable of doing. And as rubrics, as a, are a metacognitive, uh, are a metacognitive tool, uh, that it means that they are a way of learning how to learn, we decided that the language we were going to use uh, 
should be in Spanish and it also should be clear for our students so they understand what they are supposed to do and they understand our expectations as well. Um, while naming the bands, we also thought uh, on our students' social emotional learning and we decided to name the bands using friendly, friendly words. So instead of saying, for example, insuficiente, we decided to name the bands primeros pasos, estás en el camino, estás llegando a la meta y has llegado a la meta. Where has llegado a la meta uh, is going to have uh, our, our expectations as teachers. This rubric uh, was a collaborative and reflective work uh, because we believe that working, working like in groups or cooperatively makes us be better teachers. So now Vero is going to, to present about teacher, student and, and rubric. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Jimena. You will see that for methodolo methodological purposes, we divided our work taking into account the teacher, the students, and the knowledge. In this case, the knowledge is um, represented by the, with the assessment actually of the knowledge in the set of rubrics. Standing from the, from the point of view of the teacher, we focus on the students and on the assessment of the knowledge. From the position of the teacher, um, we know that the rubrics actually showed like the teacher's expectations in the rubric. In the band four, the teacher shows what she expects or what she thinks an ideal student would be. In order to work on this set of rubrics, we as a group, we took into account the Marco Curricular de Referencia Nacional, the Common Framework of Reference of Uruguay, and the Learning Progression. And we also thought as a group of our ideal second grade students. As Jimena was saying, we also decided the language that we were going to use had to be familiar to both the teacher and the student. As you will see uh, afterwards, and as Jimena mentioned before, uh, considering the students, the rubric that we prepared is written in Spanish, and we took into account the emotionality of the students um, thinking about the wording that we were going to use in the rubrics. We also think that the rubrics are a good opportunity of negotiating with the students because there are some things that we may negotiate with the, with the students along the year. And the rubrics also show, for example, they may show the student, okay, this is what the teacher wants and what she knows that I will be able to achieve. Now, uh, Gustavo will describe for us the characteristics of the rubric. Thank you, Vero. Well, actually, while we are working with this, we consider that some characteristic of the set of rubrics. First of all, we consider that they are a democratizing element as it sets clear rules for both the teachers and students. Then, we consider that they should be written in a friendly language. Actually, this is a linguistic decision because it should be friendly for both teachers and students when they are going to approach the content of the, the rubrics. Then, we consider that we should uh, focus on the gains and not the deficit. And as Aldo has stated in many of his talks, and as Veronica was talking about, about, we should avoid the deficit theory and focus on the positive aspect rather than on the negative ones. Then for teachers, it's a way of sharing their expectations towards students' work, students' achievements. And for students, at the same time, it's a way of self-assessment. It's a metacognitive technique, as Jimena was saying, is for a student it means what to learn and how they learn. And of course, we consider that we must show coherence between the task and the assessment criteria. And last but not least, we consider that rubrics should be shared or negotiated with our students. Of course, at the beginning of the year, we can 
get to, well, present to our students and already prepare rubric. But then, as the year goes on, we can adapt a rubric or even create a new one with our students. So, as we are going to see in the next slide, while we are working and deciding, discussing about the rubrics, after a long discussion in all the team, we, just, we consider that these are part of the main issues we should consider while dealing with a set of rubrics. Uh, textual framework, content, language, presentation, linguistic elements, and commitment and ethics. And as we are going to see in the next slide, and Jimena is going to talk, I think Jimena Oraldo, sorry, one of them is going to talk about this textual framework. Uh, actually, actually, it's me who's going to speak. It's a, it's a different version of Jimena who's going to speak, but, um, but I'm going to talk about the layout. Uh, I'm going to talk about the layout of the set of rubrics. And as, as Jimena was mentioning before, here you have the four bands. You have the primeros pasos, estás en el camino, estás llegando a la meta, y has llegado a la meta. But if you see, if you especially see number, I mean, the fourth part, the fourth part is, you can see that when we go to the part of the layout of, of the book, uh, oh, sorry, of the project, it says that there must be sentences and the sentences are differentiated one from the other. Then there are paragraphs and then there are different parts, uh, the different parts of the project, like the introduction, the main part, and then the conclusion. So here you can actually see the three parts and those three parts are also in primero pasos because you have the sentences that are incomplete, then, then the ideas are a little mixed up and then there are no paragraphs and there are no different parts. So uh, you'll see that they have to be very clear and you have to be very emphatic about what we want from our students. In the next slide, you are going to see another area that we work with, and this is the area of the content, okay? And in the case of the content, one thing that we have to do as teachers is that at the very beginning, when we set the topic for the project, we have to say, okay, something that is, the content that is necessary for this project is this, 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 and this. So, in Has Llegado a la Meta, it says, you have included all the different topics. Each topic was developed. That means that it has subsidiary information, examples, illustrations, everything. And then it has arguments. And then if we go back to the previous slide, it, it also has another element that is important is that each paragraph contains one topic and not more than one. So now, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Veronica, uh, who's going to speak about the use of the language, uh, not only in the project, but also in the presentation. Thank you, Aldo. At the moment of assessing language in the project, we took into account uh, the oral and the written format of the, of the project. In the fourth band, um, we we decided that we were going to take into account that the students have presented the project in a clear way and that also the presentation and the preparation of the project allows all their classmates like to, to receive the message that the student wants to convey. That is what we decided to take into account in Has Llegado a la Meta. Now Jimena will work on the presentation of the project. Okay, so regarding the presentation of the project, we thought uh, that uh, in the descriptor number four, okay, so let's focus on, on that descriptor, we thought that our main expectations were for students to make eye, eye contact with their classmates and with the teacher, to keep their voices loud and clear, and to move around the classroom while presenting. And now, if we focus on, on primeros pasos, uh, which is the first descriptor, as I mentioned while I was presenting before, uh, we thought we shouldn't mention or highlight our students', our students uh, weaknesses. 
And instead, we thought that it would be like a good idea to promote our students' critical thinking by asking them questions so they can reflect on them. So we decided uh, to ask them, do you think you involve your classmates during the presentation? Instead of saying you didn't involve your classmates, it was a good way to, to make it like through questions. Uh, because we strongly believe this is a much better way of helping them achieve what we are, ex what they are expected to do, okay, in, in the scripture number four. And now Tavo is going to, to present about uh, paralinguistic elements. Thank you, Jimena. As we can see in this paralinguistic element slide, actually our main aim is to strike a balance between the content the student includes in his or her project and the paralinguistic element he includes, whether they are pictures, videos, audios, audiovisual material, links to websites, but there should be a coherence between the content and the paralinguistic element he or she includes. That's why as it is stated in as llegado a la meta. And we also consider in, in the next slide commitment to the work and ethics. And as we can see in the fourth band, we consider that of course students have to include content in their project, but also they have to include, I don't know, a reflection. They have to show that they have reflected upon the content, talking or read, uh, writing and expressing their feelings and uh, writing with their own words, reflections, and may, um, even including some quotes from authors that have already investigated about the uh, topic they are talking about. So I think in terms of rubric, the set of rubrics, we have tried to include all of the aspects. So I think that Aldo, him and Veronica this is a part of the question section that we have some questions here in the chat. Yes, yes some teachers have, uh, yes, most of teachers who participated in the chat agree with the use of rubrics. Some of them say it is rather difficult. Yes, of course. Even we, in the process of creating this set of rubrics, it was a long discussion and very, well, it was more than a week discussing going on, going forward, backwards with the use of, and even what Jimena was saying, changing from, uh, from negative sentences to question sentences. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and something that uh, I want to make clear about this use of rubrics is that we also created a profile of a student we wanted. And sometimes having this profile in mind is, is important in order to maintain or to keep uh, this idea of rubrics um, clear. Because one aspect that sometimes it happens or that sometimes happens is that uh, we create a set of rubrics, then we apply the rubrics to a particular project and let's imagine that the student uses technology and we want to give more, more, uh, more value to the use of technology. It's impossible because that was not part of the set of rubrics. So uh, it's important to be clear about your expectations, about the student you want to be presenting in front of you. And then with all these, you can use the set of rubrics. For all of you who are going to be using the book, Living Uruguay 2 or Living Uruguay 1 or Living Uruguay 3, which are going to be fully available next year. One thing that I want you to, that we want you to pay attention to is that this set of rubrics are an example, but then you have to adapt if you need it. You need to adapt these to the context and to your own your students. So having said all these, we want to thank all of you for being here and for watching this video. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the team was to say something, but if not, we should finish our our recording here. So.